はい、こんにちは。So, good morning.、Uh, What do you expect from us from the with the group project? Yeah, I, that's that's the question is way too generic to answer. So I think in the first lecture I already explained I think quite a lot about the group projects and there are I think five pages of instructions in the、uh, in in the instructions for the、uh, business plan.、Um, so it, I, I hope everything if you read through that that's clear. Uh, also, there is what you have to do for the first and second presentation. And if if you have any questions, I I am happy to answer it. But maybe a bit more specific than this question. Um. So what are we going to do today? So、uh, last week we、uh, didn't really make it to the lecture. Um, of course,、um, so we ended up with uh, discussing uh, the fusion of innovation, and、uh, we'll continue that, and then we'll pick it up with the、uh, uh, business models and business model canvas. So let's start with the previous lecture, innovation. Fine, there it is. So, Marijn, if you have,、uh, if if you.、Um, Can formulate a more specific question, then I can answer it uh, uh, off, like let's say at the end of the lecture or before the break or so. Okay. So、um, last week we、uh, I explained that if you look at how innovations diffuse、um, across、um, society as a whole, or at least across the industry that you're interested in.、Um, There are different ways of studying that. Oh, okay. Ah, great. I'm wondering if we should already have started. Well, yeah.、Uh, next week on Thursday, it's the、um, uh, we have the first workgroup sessions.、Uh, sorry, next week on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, the first workgroup sessions. And for the first workgroup sessions, you have to present. Your ID, so the innovation you came up with, and、uh, you know, the, the the people who will adopt it, the markets, etc. So parts A through C from the business plan, and you have to present that.、Um, so that should be about done before next week.、Um, so if you haven't started yet, I would start soon.、Um, and yeah, so that's.、Uh, um, That's a deep responsibility for of, of, that you have if you are at the university. That、um, I'll see next week is the presentation. In a couple of weeks, there's another presentation. Then you are at the business plan, and that's it. So you don't get credits for the presentation. Oh, sorry. Hi. So you don't get credits for the presentation, but you、um, uh, you will get feedback on the presentation. So if you haven't done anything for the presentation and you decide not to present anything. Fine by me,、um, but that means that you don't get feedback on your innovation、uh, and on your ideas.、Um, moreover, for the rest of the group, it's very fun to hear what you actually did、um, and what presentation and what innovations you came up with. So there are no credits for the presentation, but it is your opportunity to get feedback on your group project. Okay. And I, I can imagine that there are more questions about the innovation and about your ideas you came up with.、Um, I think it's it's best to、e、email me uh, uh, those,、um, and then I I can answer them later.、Um, let's see. So last week I、um, told you about if you think about how innovation is diffused throughout society,、um, there are different ways of thinking about it, and one of the、uh, Uh, in the lecture, I want to explain two different ways. So, first of all, there are S curves. So, those are、um, how technologies improve, and then so at first it's very difficult to get a new technology to innovate and start it. And once it gets, once it is started, it's relatively easy to improve upon the innovation. And after a while, it becomes more and more difficult. And then all of a sudden, okay, 
there's room for a new innovation. So think um, old fashioned uh, CRT televisions and then new now flat screen TVs, um, things like that. Um, and we discussed that last week and then we ended up with diffusion of innovation. And I uh, showed this picture uh, about diffusion of innovation. And diffusion is, um, I think maybe many of you already have seen uh, this picture, or already have discussed uh, Rogers in, uh, in uh, other lectures and courses. Um, but Rogers is the, for those of you who haven't, Rogers is one of the most well known people who thought about how people adopt innovations. Um, throughout society and or throughout the group you're interested in as an organization. And he is most well known for the picture now on screen or the different stages or the different groups of people who adopt innovations. Um, starting with the people who adopted innovation, the innovation first, the innovators and ending with the people who are very late in adopting the innovation or may never adopt the innovation or the laggards. Um, more about that later, um, because this is not the only thing he's known for. So the, this figure is most you know, most clear, most obvious, but um, he wrote a whole book of you that you had to read the first chapter about innovation. And in there, he explains um, the entire adoption of the innovation throughout a social system. And he defines innovation, uh, sorry, he defines diffusion as a process by which innovation is communicated through certain channels over time across the members of a social system. In each of these parts, um, he discusses in detail in this book, so what is an innovation, how do you communicate it through channels over time, social system. Um, and I want to discuss these shortly. So these are the main um, parts of his theory, so adoption, communication, over time, and social system. Um, what is a bit confusing about this theory is that he, on the one hand, talks about adoption of an innovation um, through a social system, and the social system is society as a whole or um, um, your customer base. Um, and he discusses how an innovation spreads through the social system until everyone who you wanted to adopt has adopted it. Um, on the other hand, he often talks about innovation adoption as an individual process. So how you decide that you want to adopt the innovation. And um, never becomes clear in the book what exactly he's talking about. So you have to keep in mind that he talks about both these things. So innovation is um, an aggregated process of time, uh, of adoption of the innovation across time and across the social system. But ultimately an innovation is, uh, adoption of an innovation is every individual making his or her own choice of adopting the innovation for him or herself. Um, and an individual here is not only not specifically an individual, but if you have an innovation for um, uh, business to business, uh, or if you work with uh, governmental organizations, the individual mm -hmm. can also, also be um, an organization or a government, etc. Um, so what he defines as the adoption and diffusion process is an information seeking and information processing activity in which an individual is motivated to reduce uncertainty, etc. Um, so what he basically considers um, diffusion of innovation is that the innovation is out there, but people have to learn that the innovation exists, have to um, know what the innovation does, what needs the innovation can fulfill, um, and ultimately therefore decide to adopt the innovation or not. And he calls this an information processing activity um, because he says it's, it's not really about the innovation it's about knowing what the innovation is about and then deciding to adopt it so it's about hearing from others what the innovation can do uh, it's about seeing others using the innovation 
and then adopting it. So he considers it the diffusion to be an information processing um, uh, uh, system. Uh, I muted, uh, I see. I saw that there were a couple of people who were not muted and I now, I think I muted everyone. Is it better? Okay. Okay. Um, so the adoption is an aggregated process over time across all those small individual decisions to adopt the innovation. Um, Roger argues that individual adaptation of, a, of an innovation, so think of a smartwatch. I think some of you may have smartwatches or Fitbits, some of you may uh, not yet or never want. Um, the smartwatch or Fitbit, and um, well, this is kind of a project which is, well, if you look at the, I think a smartwatch is you know, or Fitbit is maybe here, somewhere, maybe starting with the early majority. So it is definitely the left stage of innovators because more and more people have a smartwatch. But if you look at how many people have the, have the smartwatch, I think it's about here or so. Um, and he says, so if individuals think about adopting a smartwatch, so they try to process information about the innovation um, and try to think if the innovation is something that they would want or they would need. Um, and in doing so, uh, Rogers argues that it depends on five product characteristics. Um, um, so the extent to which people are willing to adopt the innovation and how easy it is for them depends on five perceived product characteristics. So relative advantage, compatibility, complexity, triability, and observability. Um, relative advantage is, well, the relative advantage, is it useful if you compare it to other products? So if you have a if you compare a smartwatch with your phone or with a regular watch, does it, do you have the feeling that it does something um, more than um, the previous product you owned? Um, compatibility is, um, does it integrate and fit with existing technologies? Um, and that, that can mean a lot of things. So, um, but usually it means that, that, that the way a technology works and the way that it looks kind of fits um, with how, um, with, with something that you're used to. So there is a reason we call um, our desktop, our Windows desktop, a desktop. So in Dutch, a bureaublad. So because it's shaped like a desktop and it looks like a desktop and we are familiar with that. So we continue to use those the images we have from our offline environment into the online environment, which makes um, Windows more compatible with what we're used to. That's why a smartwatch looks like a watch, because we are used, we, we know how a watch works. There is two. Three is complexity. Well, that's easy. Uh, a new innovation must not be too difficult to understand and to use. Um, Triability is can you um, try the adoption before um, adopting it. You know, can you uh, um, uh, try it out for a couple of weeks? Uh, can can you then return it, etc. And finally, observability. So um, seeing others is not really a product characteristic, but it's an aspect of the innovation that you can market. Um, do you see others with the innovation? And if you see other people that you value with the innovation, then you as well may be more willing to adopt the innovation. 
Um, well, these five characteristics are for Rogers pretty important, but this is also an issue with uh, the fusion of innovation and many other uh, theories of uh, adoption of technology. So they all have their different factors that affect product adoption. Um, so Roger mentioned these five and other theories have, again, different types of factors and until you have like hundreds of them. Um, and I think these are pretty important, but they may not be only ones. Um, so you may have more factors that affect if you adopt an innovation. Um, we will see that in a, a lecture six, uh, when we talk about people and innovation uh, in an organization. And there we see another model, which kind of explains the different factors that lead to technology or innovation adoption. Um, to give you a bit of a heads up, this is the standard technology acceptance model, and it's the, the first and the simplest version of how people adopt technology. So they say, if you would want to adopt a new technology or an innovation, or, and later on, basically anything, um, you think about the usefulness of the product, you think about the perceived ease of use, um, then you form an attitude, and then you adopt it. Well, I'll explain more about this in a lecture on uh, when we talk about um, uh, people and technology. Um, but for now, remember that you can kind of place all these factors from Rogers on perceived use from perceived ease of use or both. So complexity is obviously related to perceived ease of use. Relative advantage is obviously related to perceived usefulness. Um, and then you have some that are maybe in between. So if you can observe someone using it, it may lead you to think that it's easy to use, but also that it's pretty useful. Um, and if you then look at other theories, they have, sorry, each of you double, but you have resolved demonstrability, normative influence. So other theories come up with, again, many different factors, which all makes it kind of confusing. Um, but I think the most important theory to remember is this one, which we will discuss in detail um, in the lecture about um, uh, uh, people and technology. So in short, um, remember that Rogers um, lists a couple of characteristics that he thinks adopt, uh, affect innovation adoption. You don't have to remember these by heart for the exam. Um, but you do have to remember that you can think of, okay, what kind of factors, what kind of characteristics that the product have, has, may affect if people are willing to adopt an innovation. And then this model, which we'll discuss in two weeks, this is the one you will have to remember. But let's not, let's not worry about that one yet. Uh, but let's do that in two weeks. Okay, so that's one. So that's the adoption process. Two is communication. Um, well, that's basically everything we do in uh, in many of our other courses uh, in in our uh, department and our program. So it's about how you can communicate the innovation um, through the different adoption groups, which basically means how is an innovation marketed. So how do people learn about the innovation and deciding that it also would work for them. Well, this course is not only about marketing, of course. Um, for the uh, bachelor students, there is a, uh, a marketing communication course um, at the same time as this course. Um, but in short, so communication is about how can you convince people in the different um, stage of the, you know, of the adoption process to adopt an innovation. And Roger argues that mass media channels are mostly useful in the top of the adoption curve. So here for the early and late majority. And he says interpersonal channels are more useful in earlier and later stages of the adoption. So um, 
when you have a new innovation um, and you want the first people to start using the innovation, you will probably not do it with a mass media campaign, but you will have those events, you know, those Apple events or other technology events or technology conferences in which you let people experience a new product in which the innovators come to a conference like that and they hear about it from organization directly or from other innovators. So it kind of makes sense that if you that in the first stage of adoption, you know, that the, the, the geeks, they mostly hear about uh, an innovation from other people and not via mass media channels. Then later on, it's probably mass media. And finally, in the end, in the later stages, so the laggards are mostly convinced by, again, interpersonal communication. So, you know, just think about explaining to your grandma how a mobile phone works. Um, now you have many different types of uh, uh, interpersonal challenge, uh, interpersonal channels. Um, so opinion leaders, your social network, friend recommendations, which are, which are all different types of getting things recommended. And um, so opinion leaders are people who are very important in a certain community, who, you, who other people um, uh, look up to for, uh, this, for adopting the specific innovation. Uh, friend recommendations are, you know, so that's word of mouth, that's one of the most important channels um, um, for adopting something or buying a product. And yeah, I'll come to hybrid later. And a social network is, is basically your whole social network of friends, but also not friends, but also acquaintances, Kennison in Dutch. So acquaintances who you not know well, so they're weak ties, but they may be people who introduce you to something new. And and there is a whole theory about how information flows through networks in which weak ties are pretty important in reaching different target groups. So, for example, if you only focus on um, strong ties within a network for innovation adoption, then the innovation is probably not spread throughout the network as a whole. So you often see that in organizations, um, that if you want to convince people in an organization to adopt, you know, to adopt Slack or adopt a new version of uh, a software system, that it's not enough to focus on the strong times only, um, but also people who just know a lot of people, so not strong ties, but people who are just like in the middle of the network and who have many, many, many connections to other people. Yeah. Um, it goes a bit too far for the lecture, but anyway, you have strong and weak ties and both so friends and acquaintances, strong and weak ties are important for the diffusion process. Okay, finally, hybrid. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. So I, um, uh, uh, hybrid is not something that Rogers uh, mentions because well, you know, he, uh, he died uh, 15 years ago. Um, but if you look at, um, if you look at marketing nowadays, and if you look at how, um, people are influenced to adopt an innovation or to, to buy a product, um, then um, nowadays we have influencers. So we all, always had influencers. So uh, think of George Clooney um, 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 advertising for an espresso. Um, but now we have all those social media influencers, you know, all those uh, TikTok influencers and Instagram influencers who uh, uh, specialize in a certain niche. Um, and they are quite interesting because they are kind of in the middle between a mass media channel and a, an, an interpersonal channel. Because on the one hand, they're influencers with a, a large follower group. And you don't know them personally in most cases. Um, so it is kind of a mass media way of influencing people. On the other hand, they have many characteristics of um, friends. So people often identify with an influencer, but people often say they 
kind of personally known influencer because they see their Instagram feed was their videos. And so an influencer is a very interesting tool to use for marketing because it is, it, it is both mass media. You can reach a lot of people, but it also has um, characteristics of interpersonal communication. So that's a definition of hybrid. Um, hybrid communication, so the middle way between mass media and interpersonal. Okay. So, oh, it's a badly, uh, bad layout, sorry. Give me a, uh, that's better. Um, so the third element of the diffusion process is diffusion over time. Um, and diffusion of an innovation over time is on the one hand an individual um, process over time. And on the other hand, it's an aggregated adoption. So the adoption of everyone over time. Um, so this knowledge persuasion decision implementation confirmation is kind of a standard decision process of adopting an innovation um, for an individual. And you have many different models that are basically arguing the same. So um, some start with attention, then interest, uh, then um, some kind of emotional connection and then a purchase decision. Um, but it all goes from, okay, you hear about the innovation until ultimately you adopt the innovation and you decide whether it's useful or not. Um, so knowledge, it starts out with, okay, I know what the innovation does um, and I have heard about the innovation, then it starts then there starts a persuasion process. So you hear about others adopting the innovation. You uh, see commercials of the innovation. And finally, you decide to adopt the innovation, the decision. Then you implement it, you start using it. And then finally, there's the confirmation that you continue to use the innovation or not. So like it says, there's often a drop in enjoyment after first use. Um, but there may also be a kind of a reinforcement that even if you don't like the innovation and have spent a lot of money on the innovation that you, in hindsight, still decide to enjoy the innovation just because you want to reduce the dissonance. Um, so on the one hand, adoption of an innovation is an individual process of getting to know the innovation until ultimately adopting it. And if you aggregate that across the system as a whole, across all the people who can adopt it, you get this. So the society industry-wide adoption of the innovation. Um, and this is important to remember. So the innovators, early adapters, early majority, late majority and laggards. So these are the different types of adopters of an innovation who all make the individual decision process at a certain point in the, adopt, in the uh, um, adoption of the, in the diffusion process um, and also have um, different reasons for adopting the innovation. Um, so for example, innovators that usually adopt an innovation because they adopt every innovation in the field. You know, people who really like Apple products that just buy every new Apple product there is. Um, because they just like the brand. Um, so they're always innovators. Um, so usually those innovators don't really have to be convinced at all. So they're just the people who really like the type of innovation and who will adopt it anyway. So early adopters are people who, so if we talk, for example, about technology adaptation, about smartphones or smartwatches or uh, the newest televisions, are the people who generally like technology, people who 
you know, we all, you all, maybe you're one of those people. And you, if not, then you probably have those people in your family or friends uh, network who always have the newest stuff, you know, who uh, are the first to adopt the smartphone uh, or the first to adopt the smartwatch, uh, who have a brand new uh, flat screen television, which is flatter than before. And so those people are the early adopters. So the early majority are just the first large group of people who adopt an innovation. Um, so who, who uh, hear about it through friends or through mass media channels and who think, okay, that may be something for me. Um, the late majority are people who take a bit longer to adopt an innovation. And finally, the laggards are the people who you really, really have to convince to adopt an innovation and who actually don't want to. Um, so, generally older people um, who, who are reluctant to adopt new innovations and who, for who it takes quite a while to adopt it, or maybe even never. Um, so what is quite interesting, I think, is um, uh, showing how quickly uh, an innovation can diffuse through the social system. So if you look at, for example, the car, the brown uh, line, you see that the adoption, the car has been around for 110 years or so, and still less than 80% of people have a car. So the adoption process is very slow. Um, same with a telephone. It took 90 years to reach 90%. But then if you look at curves like, I think the, I think this is an old picture, but if you look at, for example, like the microwave, the television, uh, the internet now has reached, at least in the Netherlands, like a, 97%, 98% or so cell phones and close to 100. Um, you have certain innovation that go, that diffuse very quickly throughout the system and other innovations that diffuse very, very slowly, if at all. Um, by the way, airplane means that not everyone has an airplane, but everyone has flown. Um, so you see there's a kind of, that it, that um, for every innovation, there is a curve like this, but um, the time it takes to adopt and how quick you get from the innovators to the early and late majority uh, really depends on the type of innovation. Um, so for internet and for, uh, let's say the mobile phone, I think the first iPhone was there in 2007. So it took, maybe 10 years to get to the, to, to get to the laggards um, in uh, the adoption of mobile phones. And of course, to be honest, in 2007, um, it was the introduction of the iPhone, but then for the smartphone markets in general, um, we already had innovators, you know, Microsoft was there in 2004, you already had those Blackberries, which were kind of smart. Um, so we already had innovators and the iPhone really spurred the adoption process. So it went, went, with, went through the early adopter, early majority stage just within like three years or so. Um, so, Finally, um, an innovation adopts through a social system. And um, again, it's important to realize that a social system are the people you expect to adopt an innovation. So if you um, have an ID for a new, um, I don't know, an, an, an app about fashion or something like that, the social system is probably not society as a whole but is your largest potential target group. Um, maybe more specific, 
if your idea for an innovation uh, for this course is something which is aimed at students, so providing student information or something like that, then your social system is the student population. Um, and that means that the adoption process is throughout the social system until ideally every student adopts the innovation. Um, so it, so diffusion of innovation does not mean that every individual in the world has to adopt the innovation. So the social system is the definition of your population. And again, a social system can also be organizations or governments. Um, and the social system comes with its own norms. It comes with its own norms and laws and ideas and culture, etc. So if you think about an innovation, you have to think about the social system your innovation is located in. So what are the laws and policies in place? Uh, what are the norms and values of the social system? You know, are they tax savvy or not? Um, what are the communication channels we can reach them through? Um, is there an, how, what is the network like? So are they, are all people connected or are they just like loose individuals who you have to target individually? Um, so is adoption more an individual process or a social process? So yes, indeed. So the social system is like the target market. Um, but a social system is your largest possible market. So usually you define your target market into several components. So in this first stage of the adoption process, we are only going to target the, um, the innovators uh, or the early adapters. So in, and then after you've reached that target market, you say, okay, we now focus on the early majority. Um, so it's like a target market, but it's your largest potential market. So for a smartphone, for example, it's basically everyone, every individual in the world. And for a, um, for a Dutch app aimed at um, university students, it's all university students in the Netherlands. Okay. So that's, Diffusion of innovation in a uh, nutshell. Um, I think there is one um, interesting uh, addition to make um, on the uh, on the diffusion of innovation, and that has to do with Gartner's hype cycle. So Gartner is a consultancy company um, consulting in uh, basically anything, but also in technology adoption, um, and they have created a hype cycle in which they um, try to predict if a uh, technology, not, not, not only technology, but if, if, if uh, let's talk about technology, if a technology is hyped or not, or if it may be a success. A bit unclear, but it will become clear in the, on the next two slides. So remember this picture. Um, the hype cycle says that there is a kind of a critical mass of adoption somewhere here. Um, and in the fusion of innovation, this is called the chasm. So, um, of course, not all innovation, well, actually, basically, seldom it is so that an innovation reaches full market penetration. So, oftentimes, an innovation just fails um, once they've reached a certain stage. And, um, the critical mass theory says that, especially between the early adopters and early majority, um, it's very difficult to convince the early majority and the rest of the market of using, uh, of starting to use the innovation. Um, so they say there is a kind of a chasm um, between the early adopters and the early majority. So once you have reached the early majority stage, uh, you have reached a critical mass, and then you can be relatively sure that your innovation will adopt further. But there is a chasm to 
over bridge um, between the early adopters and the early majority. Because um, innovators and early adopters are usually people who are very enthusiastic about a new technology. Um, so they are the customers who, who, who like technologies, who want those uh, increases in performance, um, um, who are kind of always looking towards the future and towards future technologies. Um, so they're enthusiasts or visionaries, but the early majority are way more pragmatic. You know, they are the people who want to adopt the innovation because it's useful for them, not because it's cool, but because they want to do something with it. Um, and especially that's so for the late majority and the laggards who are often skeptic. So in the first place is people want, just want the technology and want the performance. And in the second stage is from the early majority onwards, uh, customers want solutions and convenience. So it's difficult to jump this gap um, and to not only explain why our technology is cool, but also to explain why it is useful for a larger market. And that's called the chasm. Um, so does anyone know an example of a product that has um, you know, fell into the uh, chasm or has successfully jumped the chasm into a uh, mass market? or a product that failed, a toothbrush. Did it, I think the toothbrush made it throughout the, uh, throughout the system, I think. Yeah, Google Glass, I think is a good example. Google Home. Uh, Margot, can you, where would Google Home be in the, uh, in the adoption uh, or in the diffusion process? Innovators, early adopters. So I'd say that Google Glass never made it past the uh, innovator stage. Yeah, and I think Google Home is still in the early adopters visionary stage. Yeah, so um, also if you look at the number of people who adopted uh, a thing like Google Home, um, and now it's up to them to kind of up to Google to convince like the early majority that it's not only very cool, but your lights dim or something like that. Um, when you get home, but also that it's pretty, pretty useful. So for example, for Google Home, I'm in the, uh, I'm probably in the maybe late majority or early majority stage. Uh, electric cars. Um, yeah, I think electric cars is also a good example. So it, electric cars now kind of are Again, here, innovators earlier, I think it's past the innovator stage. It's in the, still in the early adopter stage, but it will, I think, I think it's a good example because it will take a lot of convincing people to, 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 uh, to switch to an electric car, especially the people who want solutions and convenience or the pragmatists. So because it's still, if you want an electric car that can drive for a couple of hundred miles or kilometers, it's still pretty expensive. Uh, cheaper electric cars only make it, well, you know, they can drive 150 kilometers and that's it. It takes a while to charge. So it will take other innovations in um, uh, battery, uh, battery technology, I think mostly before an electric car um, reaches the early majority, or it will take a lot of other um, convincing like um, um, uh, government incentives or something like that. So an electric car is a good example, I think, of something that may, well, let's all hope it ultimately makes it throughout the uh, system, but it, it, if nothing happens, then it may fall into the chasm, yeah. Um, so the interesting thing about the chasm is that it relates to Gartner's hype cycle. So Gartner says, so, um, for every technology or basically for every hype, um, the process of going through every hype goes like this. So there is a kind of a technology trigger. Oh, we have, let's say 3D printers. 
Um, and then suddenly people start to adopt 3D printers, but it's still in its early stages of the technology. But there is a lot of buzz in the, for the innovators in, um, uh, about 3D printers. Oh, there's just so much you can do with 3D printers. Um, and then you kind of reach, which they call the peak of inflated expectations. Um, and Gartner is saying, well, many tech, for many technologies, after this peak of inflated expectations, you just drop down into a throb of the loose uh, disillusionment. Um, so, okay, it may be a wonderful technology and, and it was hyped, but now we have to think about what can we do with the technology that's actually useful. Um, and then people don't know. And then Gartner says for some, some technologies, there's kind of a slope of enlightenment in which people suddenly realize that the technology is not only hyped, but also useful. Um, and then saw, and then over time, the technology gets adopted. Um, so if you look at electric cars, they are maybe here, I think. It's not a throughout disillusionment, or maybe I'm maybe I'm too pessimistic and electric cars are already here on the slope of enlightenment. Um oh, I don't I don't know. Um but for example, if you think about things like blockchain, um blockchain is here. It's I think it has hit rock bottom right now. So it was hyped a couple of years ago, it was really here, and every every organization had to do something with the blockchain. So people hired IT personnel to build blockchain. Um, but now many organizations realize they actually have no clue how they can use blockchain in the organization. So blockchain might remain here, but it also may go through the slope of enlightenment and people start thinking of ways that you can use it. Um, so this hype cycle is on the one hand pretty interesting to um, you know to place technologies on to place innovations on um, but moreover um, it kind of matches nicely with um, the chasm so with the adoption stages by Rogers so um, the chasm in the diffusion process is basically the same as the throw of disillusionment in the hype cycle. So the innovators and some of the early adopters adopt the innovation, but then um, like more and more people don't know what they can do with the innovation um, and it goes into the chasm and then maybe some innovations reach um, or go through the slope of enlightenment and leads to a plateau of productivity. Um, so I think there is a nice congruence between the hype cycle and between the whole idea of a chasm uh, in uh, the diffusion process. Uh, and I think it's also you know, kind of illustrative of many technologies, um, for example, like blockchain that many people adopted and there's now, okay, what can we do with the blockchain? Okay, maybe nothing, maybe it stays here. Um, or I think smartwatches, um, where I think we're already through, or maybe there were there was never a chasm. Um, and for smartwatches are now basically back on the slope of enlightenment. It's very present in the gaming industry. Oh, can you elaborate? So for specific games you mean, or uh, for um, um, consoles? And while the type, I... Um, yeah. Yeah, I think it's just true, especially now. So I'm not really into gaming, um, but you see with many games that they release a game often when it's not really finished yet, and then it doesn't work at all, you need disappointment, then they patch it up, and then um, 
you see this love of enlightenment coming up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think gaming is a very good example. So I, what was the game? Was it from Ubisoft? That was it. I, I don't remember. Um, yeah, yeah, Ubisoft. I only have a uh, steering wheel, so I do have a PlayStation. Uh, but I mostly do Gran Turismo. Um, so to which the four station uh, uh, goes recon, yeah, that's the problem yet, yeah. Um, okay, uh, to which the four stages of diffusion does chasm and hype cycle belong or none, and what's the best additional theory? Yeah, so um, Rogers came up with the diffusion of innovation. So he only spoke of the uh, five stages of adoption, so innovators to laggards. Uh, and then later on, other people said, well, well um, there's actually a chasm between early adapters and early majority somewhere uh, around there. Um, so it was not uh, Rogers. Um, so they said, well, okay, it's uh, be because they said, well, well Rogers basically only talks about innovations that make it through the entire process. Um, but you see that many innovations don't reach maturity, so they fail. Um, so they introduce the chasm and they say, for well, innovations fail because they don't take into account the differences between innovators and early adopters on the one hand and the early majority and late majority, etc. on the other hand, because they have different reasons for adopting an innovation. Um, so they introduced the chasm, and then later on, Gardner came with the hype cycle, um, and then it turned out, and then it turned out that the hype cycle, that the theories of the hype cycle and the chasm actually fitted nicely uh, with each other. So they actually were you know, developed differently. So one in science, one from a, a commercial consultancy company, but they kind of matched, and that's why here we combine them. Um, so the chasm and the hype cycle don't really belong to any of the uh, five stages. Um, so it's just additional theory of explaining why innovations don't fail. Okay, let me finish the hype cycle stuff and then we can have a short break and then we continue with business models. Um, because I have one slide, so this is from um, uh, uh, Gardner as well, and it kind of explains how you um, can use the hype cycle as a tool, as an organization to um, uh, decide whether you want to invest in innovation. So you don't have to remember this, just an example, but you have to um, remember that um, if you're an organization and if you find out about an innovation, if you find out about, you know, for example, blockchain, you need to think about, okay, um, where on the hype cycle would this innovation be? Um, how important for us would it be if we miss um, this innovation? So if we only adopt it later on? Um, and how risky is the innovation? So what is the chance that it ends up in the gas and, and never recovers? Um, so for example, if you're a bank, um, so um, blockchain, is most well known for all the e-coins like Bitcoin, et cetera. Um, so if you are a bank, then it probably blockchain for you is probably pretty important. So even if you're not sure if it will be a success, it's probably best if you're a bank to invest in blockchain so that you at least know what it is. And that if it becomes kind of mainstream that you're one of the first to jump on the bandwagon. Um, so if you're a bank and think about blockchain, okay, you probably want to invest in it. If you're a governmental organization, um, you know, a city, um, or, or if you are a you know, supermarket or whatever, then maybe investing in blockchain now is less relevant. So maybe you can just wait it out and adopt it once um, it's there. So um, the GASM is a useful tool to think about um, 
to think about as an organization, you know, to think about what can we do with the innovation? Should we invest now? Should we wait it out? But of course, it's easier said than done because you, you, you never know if an innovation will be a success. So this is the um, hype cycle for emerging technologies 2020. I don't know if blockchain is still on here. Don't think so. I also don't even know what most of these are, but this is what they um, this is what what Gartner has came up with for 2020. So for example, they say for well, um, um, embedded AI is pretty hyped now. Um, it will probably re reach maturity and up here within two to five years. Um, health passport is re here, but it probably is something that we will adopt very quickly. So it takes two years to end up here, etc. So of course, yeah, self-driving cars are, I think, here. So they're still at the left side. Um, so still more in the innovation trigger. And I think once we have the first, you know, um, a commercial self-driving car, which is uh, approved uh, to drive maybe in a certain area, then I think we will quickly reach the peak of inflation expectations. And then it will probably turn out that self-driving cars, you know, they um, mistakenly hit a couple of people um, on the street and then probably enthusiasm will drop. And then maybe in the future, um, it will, um, uh, become more popular again. But it also indicates that innovation will not produce plus productivity. Yeah, that's it's it, um, Gartner will say yes because it's a consultancy company. I will say no. Um, it's it's very difficult to predict beforehand what your innovation will do um if if you can you would be a millionaire billionaire um so that there are some indications you know you can think of um all these things we talked about you know is the innovation uh, relatable uh, is it uh um I forgot all these things so you can think of all these things, relative advanced compatibility, complexity. So you can think of all the characteristics of the innovation. You can think of the uh, connection between the innovation and the target market. Uh, you can think about things like the cost of the innovation. And then you can make a prediction of, okay, will it be a success? But of course you, yeah, you, know, you will never know for sure. And sometimes there are very good innovations that fail and very bad innovations that you know, reach it through the market. Um, so for example, I think, an, uh, a nice example in the uh, book by Rogers is the adoption of the uh, QWERTY uh, uh, keyboard. So um, the keyboard we have, uh, at least that we have in, uh, so sorry for you, uh, uh, not in the Netherlands and, or um, the US. So we have a QWERTY. And if you're in Belgium, you have a Z um, as the first letter. Um, but that's actually not the best layout for a keyboard at all. Um, it's just what someone came up with who developed a typewriter. Um, and it's kind of useful for typewriters, but it's absolutely not useful for typing uh, on a keyboard. So it would be way better if we would have the E, which we use the most in the center of the keyboard, uh, or maybe a bit left or right of the center. Um, but we don't. And you have better keyboard layouts, Vorak, um, it's a better layout, but no one uses it. So that's, um, so Dvorak keyboard layout is objectively a better layout for a keyboard. QWERTY is objectively worse, but still QWERTY is the one we use and Dvorak we don't because we're just used to it. So although you can maybe predict if an innovation will be a success based on all the factors we talked about, and that we will talk about in coming lectures, it ultimately is never 
you're never able to uh, to know for sure. Okay. Um, shall we have a short break, like say five minutes or so, and then we continue uh, the fourth lecture. Okay, see you in five minutes.
Hello? Okay. Okay, this better? Good, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Talking about technology adoption and usability, I have Galaxy Buds, um, but I have two of them. So I have these and these, which are basically the same, but still different. Um, if I take out my earbuds and then I and I put them back in again, they don't work. But I haven't had the time uh, to uh, check uh, and to to solve it. So sorry for for asking. Let's continue. Um, so for the rest of the lecture, we're going to talk about business models and the business model of Canvas. And I think this is also something that's pretty useful, of course, for your um, uh, assignments. Um, but also, I think in general, so thinking about what a business model is, um, is, is useful for when you work in an organization and have to think about your marketing campaigns or any development of products. Uh, but a business model is also something that you have to um, uh, understand if you have, if you want to, you know, start your own business. You have to write a business plan, and you know, a commercial business plan is, is different from the one. Of, different to some extent for the one you have to write for this assignment, uh, but also uh, to some extent similar because you also have to explain the value you create and the idea you have. Um, so thinking about uh, what a business model is uh, and thinking about the different elements of a business model, I think it's a very useful um, uh, thing to know. So let's get started. Um, there are many different definitions of a business model, but I think the um, most easy definition is, okay, think about an innovation. An innovation is an invention plus um, the value the invention can create. So explaining why it will be a success. Um, the business model is that part. The business model is explaining why your ID will be a success. Um, so that's the most simple definition. It's a bit more extended than that, of course, because it's not only explaining why it built a success, but also taking into account um, the surrounding. So taking into account what, what you need. So what do you, does your organization need um, in, in order to um, you know, uh, make the product or provide the service? Um, how, how will you um, um, get your initial funding? How will you make money? Uh, everything surrounding the explanation of why your idea will be a success um, and the explanation of why your idea is a success is a business model. So that kind of matches the uh, dif different definitions on this slide. So the capabilities and resources required to create, market and deliver value um, and the ability to generate revenue streams. Uh, the second definition by T's is also again the value proposition. So why this useful? Um, the revenues and costs and uh, delivering that value, how you deliver that value. And the, uh, the third one is basically also the same. So um, it's explaining how you create value and how your organization will make this happen. Um, so if you look at the different definitions of business models, um, there are basically four main aspects to a business model. So um, first of all, there is like there's the innovation part. So it's um, so uh, in, in this course we talk about innovations mostly, but uh, you can apply this to um, new products, new campaigns as well. So first of all, there's the business model. Uh, sorry, the, there's the innovation. So which is your invention plus why you think the invention is useful. Then you have the market. It's thinking about, okay, who will adopt the innovation? It's what we talked about before the break in the previous lecture. Then you have the cost and revenue stream. So how much money will the innovation and the uh, will it cost to start producing? Um, and how much revenue will we derive from the innovation? And finally, the organization surrounding it. So how do we tailor our organization in order to be able to um, 
create the innovation. So the whole innovation part is basically only innovation and maybe thinking about the markets a bit. But the business model is taking it a step further and thinking not only about your innovation, but also about the market organization and cost environment. Um, so basically, if you want to remember one thing, a business model is thinking about these four parts. Now we're going to extend it a bit later on, um, but these four parts are the main components of a business model. Um, I think that from side step is that, that you, you see in uh, today's economy that business models are actually also part of the innovation itself. Um, so two lectures ago, we talked about that you can also innovate your business model. So you don't have to come up with a new product um, in, or, or a new service, but you can also innovate the entire way you do business. Um, so I gave our Airbnb, for example, as an example of uh, an innovation, which is also a new service, but also an entire new way of doing business. Um, but there are other ways. And uh, in the paper by Cavadias and others, uh, they observe um, uh, they, they observe many organizations, I about, about 50 or so, maybe more. Um, and they observe new ways how those organizations are trying to organize their organizations and do business. And they came up with the following list, um, not all of which are interesting for us because some of them are very technical. Um, but some, and some of them are more interesting. So for example, personalization, so they observe, no, one moment. I forgot to close the door. Um, so the first one is personalization. So personalization is that, that you see that many organizations now increasingly um, offer personalized products. Uh, so it's kind of the on-demand markets. You know, I, um, yesterday I saw a television ad for um, uh, Choco Prince from Lu uh, cookies. Um, in which you can even personalize the package. Um, so, you know, you can send your picture and then get the personalized package with Choco Prince with a picture of you or whatever. Um, and you increasingly see this, or you increasingly see that organizations offer personalization as a business model. You know, create your own whatever, t-shirt, peanut butter, basically anything. Um, so that's one business model that you um, more and more observe. So the second one is a closed loop. That's less interesting for us, but that basically means that it's uh, it's cradle to cradle. So um, that you don't think about waste, but you think about, okay, um, how can we make sure that our organization has no waste at all? So that everything that, that we sell, that people use is the input for a new product. Um, like, you know, you can uh, hand in your, your used Nespresso cups and then they make other stuff out of it or reuse the captions. Um, the third one is asset sharing, um, which basically means that, um, uh, well, uh, assets are things in your organization that um, cost money and or bring in money. So your um, IT department is an asset, your machines are an asset, your people are an asset. Um, and asset sharing means that you share assets from your organization with other organizations. So, or you, so for example, Airbnb and Uber, they share their assets with their customers um, because Airbnb has no hotels. So Airbnb is a booking website and booking.com as well, um, but they don't have they don't have hotels, so they have nothing, only a platform. So they basically share or outsource their assets, what brings in money to another organization, so to people who have a room to spare or an extra apartment. Um, and this is a model that you see more and more, that's called the platform-based economy. Um, 
and in which organizations are basically don't have any don't have assets but basically are a platform to connect assets and demand for those assets with each other um the third fourth one is uses based pricing so that means that um you bill people for um the amount that they use something it's for us it's not that interesting but um for example our university students emails is outsourced to google so actually your university um, account is a gmail address sort of um and the university just pays google for every uh, based on the number of students enrolled um well, the last one is not that interesting as well. So agile and adaptive organizations, so decentralization, outsourcing, coalitions. Um, we will talk a bit about that um, more in the lecture about virtual organizations. Um, and a collaborative ecosystem, um, finally, is um, what you see now is that many organizations work together in providing a service to customers. So um, if you think of Android or Apple, they, they work together with telephone companies, with app developers, etc., in order to provide apps to a mobile phone. Um, so these are six features of new business model. And the reason I discuss them because it's um, um, so because you oftentimes think of an organization as a, you know, an organization is out there, they make a product or a service and that they sell that and that's it. But if you look at nowadays the current day economy and if you look at how organizations change you see a lot of innovation uh, happening within organizations as well so you see the, uh, like the you see the very definition of an organization change um, um, with because they develop new ways of doing business okay again we will talk a bit more about this in the lecture on virtual organizations Okay, the business model compass. Um, uh, Osterwald and Pinier, so there are two people from Belgium, they uh, developed the business model compass, which is both a theory and a practical tool for organizations to um, build their own business model. Um, and for them, the business model compass is their business model. So they, they sell the business model compass. They offer consultancy for the business model compass. They help organizations to fill in this compass for a certain product. Um, and this business model compass is, so is, is, this is a, a tool. And if you have a new ID for a new product or a new service, you just, you know, you can tick off all the boxes and then think about, okay, what is our value proposition? Uh, who are our customers, uh, how do we make revenue, etc. Mm. So the business model compass consists of nine different uh, aspects or features, um, but they fit nicely within, to the, within the four uh, main features of, this, of uh, business model I discussed before. So the value proposition is about the innovation, what the innovation can offer. The market is the customer. So how you reach the customer, who are, um, who are your specific customers. Cost structure and revenue streams is of course about costs and revenue. And finally, the key partners activities and resources is about how you organize your organization around the innovation. Okay. Um, so we don't have much time left. So I think I think I promised uh, last week that if I ran out of time, I would just tape or record the rest of the lecture um, and put it online so we can start uh, afresh uh, next week um, with strategy so that I um, you know, so that I don't remain running behind and doing the last part of the lecture in the lecture after that. 
So I think that's a very good idea. So I will continue until um, you know uh, uh, half past uh, ten or maybe a few minutes after that, and then I will just record the rest of the lecture um, so that you can uh, uh, view it on your own time. Is that, is that okay? I hope so, uh, because then next week we can just start with strategy. We don't have all the uh, confusion of uh, doing the rest of the lecture. Okay. Okay. Sorry for my very bad time management. Um, okay. So let's start with the value proposition. So the value proposition is basically what we learned um, in the last couple of weeks. So what is the innovation? Uh, and what is the innovative aspect of the innovation? So it's not about the technology. It's about what need does the technology fulfill or what problem does it solve? Um, so in the chapter by Osterwaller, you say you see that they um, come up with many different examples of uh, different needs uh, or problems that the innovation can solve or fulfill. Um, uh, they say, for, okay, it can be a new need entirely. It can solve an existing problem and your innovation can in can be similar to an existing product, but just increase performance. Uh, it, it can be a customization of a different innovation, it can have a better design, so it's more accessible or usable. Um, you can also innovate so by creating status or identity, which is more like a marketing innovation instead of a product innovation. Um, you can also innovate by having the same product, but just making it cheaper, you know, reducing costs in your organization. Or maybe you can even reduce risks. So all different examples, but it basically boils down to, okay, what need does an organization fulfill or what problem does it solve? Um, also interesting uh, for those of you who took uh, communication theory from me uh, last year or maybe a uh, longer time ago, um, in communication theory, we talked about the difference between um, informational and transactional products. Um, and informational products are, pro are products that are usually a bit more you know, boring, like insurances or something like that. Um, those are usually products that solve a problem. Um, products, on the other hand, that fulfill needs are more often transformational products, you know, then I want to go on holiday, so I book a holiday. Uh, I want um, you, uh, so uh, I want a new dress, for example, uh, fancy dress that's also fulfills a need because you want to look uh, great. Um, you don't have to remember that, but this is uh, kind of an overlap between what you're doing communication theory and here. So the value proposition is about the, um, uh, um, it's just a definition of the innovation in terms of value it delivers for the customer. And of course, it doesn't have to be the same for every customer. So it, you, you can have different value propositions for different types of customers. For, so for example, if you look at uh, Apple's products or the iPhone and uh, MacBook, then the innovators and early adapters, they, um, they adopt Apple products because they um, identify with the brand. You know, they think it's cool to have an iPhone. Um, but for other people, usually later on in the adoption process, um, it's more often useful to have an iPhone. Um, so the value proposition is tailored to different, um, to different types of customers. Um, also, the value proposition connects um, the organizations, um, connects the innovations and the organization's wider strategy. So the innovation, um, so you, that's why you you can just you cannot innovate something completely new in an organization in which the innovation does not fit. Um, so the innovation needs to match your customers, but also needs to match your organization. Um, 
And that's why we practice that in your business plan. So that's why you have to write in the second part of your business plan, okay, um, what is the organization um, in, which your organ in which your innovation um, fits or is the strategy of the organization, etc. So without an organization that matches the innovation, you cannot, you simply cannot do the innovation. Um, so the innovation must match an organization strategy on basically four different levels, um, societal, industry, market, and firm level. And this is the last thing I will, um, um, I will explain. Then we jump to uh, the market part of the innovation and then I will quit the lecture and record it further. Um, I cannot continue now because I have a lecture at 11 o'clock as well. So I have to uh, quit at some point. Uh, but let me finish this and then we um, quit the lecture. Um, because basically I can explain this quite quickly. Um, so the value proposition must match the organization strategy on four levels. And basically that's what we'll be discussing next week. So an innovation must fit within wider uh, social and societal development. So um, for example, um, we have innovation in uh, genome testing, but society is not completely ready for it yet. Um, there is a tool to find out, so a strategic tool to find out, okay, how does your innovation fit within um, the wider surroundings of your organization? And that's called PESTEL. And that's what we uh, uh, will be discussing next week when we talk about strategy, because many of these, uh, uh, because this concerns organization strategy as well. No. So the innovation must also match the wider industry in which your organization is suited. Um, so are other organizations in our competitors working uh, on the same innovation? Um, is, uh, are there other innovations that I need to take care about or need to think about? Um, what can my suppliers do? Can they just completely skip me and deal with the customer directly? Um, the tool for that is five forces analysis to take into account the surroundings. Your value proposition must also, thirdly, um, relate to the market, so the specific area of the innovation to determine the attractiveness of the market. So, and that's the reason why we talked about the whole diffusion of innovation process. So. If you have an idea, okay, maybe we could do this as an organization. So if you, for example, make regular phones now, it may not be wise to invest um, in starting making smartphones because smartphones are in the, in the laggard stage and are quite mature. So maybe you can invest in fold, folding phones or something like that or virtual reality directly because the market is quite full. So the value proposition must relate to the market level in terms of, okay, where are we in the diffusion curve? Um, what is the uh, level of technology for this specific innovation? Um, and will we create revenue or has everyone already adopted the innovation? Finally, the firm level that is fitting the innovation within your um, internal organization. So is your internal organization fit for the innovation? And that's what we'll be talking about in two weeks. So that's the value proposition part, then the market part and the rest of the business model canvas will become available online. I think at the, um, I think on uh, Wednesday. Um, so for now, thank you very much. And I will let you know on canvas when the rest is uh, uh, available. So thanks, and I will see you next week uh, with a clean slate, and then we talk about uh, strategy. Okay, thanks very much. Good luck this week with your other courses. Start preparing um, your business plan if you haven't done so uh, before, because next week already are the first presentations. Good luck.